our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Hey, good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Man, y'all sound good, looking good. Glad you are here today. Look at your neighbor and say, you're in the right place today. Now look at your other neighbor and say, you're looking good today. Tell them they're looking good. All right, how many knows when the preacher butters you up, he's about to tear you apart? Come on, somebody. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm excited to have you here. My name's Joey. I'm lead pastor. We have a lot of people vacationing and traveling. I'm so thankful you're here, and I'm praying that God will fill everybody up. And how many knows we all need rest and relaxation, and we need to get our batteries filled up and charged? But we're kicking off a series called Battle Ready. Before I get into that, um, first service, how many of our youth are in here? How many fo folks come with the... the Alright, we got a few. I can't see everybody. We have, uh, this morning I was going to share this, and Alex was going to come up with me. Uh, how many of you have met Alex and Mallory? There are new youth pastors. We've got three people. Okay, they're really bad people. Okay, four people. Alright. Now, they're really good folks, and uh, Alex is, uh, they've stepped in. I love their heart, love their spirit. So this morning we actually... Uh, set them in place. We prayed over them, had the church pray over them, and ask God's blessing on them. I think, I think God's wanting to do something great with our young people. Amen? amen. And uh, y'all can talk to me. It's all right, okay? You don't get kicked out of here if you say amen every now and then, right? Amen. But uh, we're, we prayed over them this morning. Alex, is, uh, he has a job where he gets called in, so he got called into work in, after we prayed for him and all those type things. So we're actually praying about getting him full time up here uh, in ministry. So how many can pray with me on this thing right here? Because we want to we get them in the high schools and get them, uh, you know, right where the action's taking place and all the good stuff. So we're excited about that. So if you get a chance, hit them up on Facebook. Or when you see them, Mallory, I think, is working with our kids right now. When you see them, just let them know you're behind them. And we just we set them forth. He feels called in ministry. And uh, he's come through our church. And if you hear him speak, he sounds like he's been speaking a long time. He's got an anointing on his life. And so, church, one of the things that we want to do is we haven't talked much about is, man, we want to take people and build them up and send them out to do what God's called them to do. Amen? Amen. And I, I think my job as a pastor and our job as a church is this, is that we want, I want to hold the ladder um, for whoever's, whatever gift you have, whatever call that's on your life. I want to be the one that holds the ladder to help you steady it and help you get to wherever you're going. And I love seeing that kind of win. So that's kind of our desire and our goal. Anyway, is that all right with y'all? Yeah. All right, here we go. Now, we're starting a series called Battle Ready, and it's uh, The War is Real. Um, how many folks um, uh, ever felt like you've been fighting the devil? Right, you ever felt that way? And, and especially in church, we know that. Well, what we're going to do over the next few weeks, and it might be more than four weeks. I tried to go forward. It may be six or seven. Is we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about the spiritual realm, and we're going to talk about how do we battle this? How do we fight warfare? How do we go about this? And so here's where some of this is coming from. I really believe this, that, uh, that there's a battle over people's souls. And I believe that battle started way back when, and we can talk about that as we hit the scriptures. But there was a, there was a poll that was taken in the United States, and out of million, three, over 300 million people, there was over 30% of the people said they did not believe there was a hell and did not believe there was a devil. Didn't even believe in the spiritual realm. And I thought, well, that's kind of crazy, you know. And so they didn't believe it. A lot of this was, and even in the church, there was a high percentage, 20 or 30% of church people didn't believe that. And as I began to think about this, I thought, you know what? The most precious thing that me and you possess is, is our soul. That God gave us a soul. And one day we're going to spend, our spirit and soul is going to spend either eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. And if I'm the devil, the first thing I want to do to mess your walk up is, is to make you think there's no hell and there's no devil, right? And so I saw that percentage. And then I realized I know churches that had started preaching uh, universalism. How many ever heard of that? Basically, it's kind of that everybody makes it to heaven. No matter where you're from, where you're coming from, what background, you make it into heaven. And, and it's kind of it's deceiving because these are Christian, quote-unquote, Christian pastors who are saying that it's all right, that there's really no hell. They're preaching the same thing, that you, you can't go there. And how many knows that Jesus said something about this? He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said, there's no other way to get to heaven but through me if you, if you believe the Bible, if you believe that kind of that word. And so there's this crazy thing that the devil's doing. So people are deceived thinking everything's all right when it's not. So what we're going to talk about is over the spirit world. We're going to talk about de devils, demons. We may talk a little bit about angels, but we're going to talk a lot about strongholds and how do we break those. Amen? Amen. Now, here's two, two ways we focus on the devil. When I start talking about this, people get interested. 
One is this, is we overemphasize the devil. Has anybody been around that group? That the devil's behind everything. You know, I failed my test, that devil. Maybe you didn't study. Come on, somebody. I, I, that devil gave me a ticket today. No, that devil didn't give you a ticket. You were texting and driving and was swerving all over the road. That's how you got your ticket, right? And so many times we give the devil glory when it really was just our stupidity, right? And so, what, so we're going to talk about this. Let me give you a scripture. And it says this in 2 Corinthians 10. And today is just going to be kind of a laying out a few things and a lot of teaching. But this is what it says in 2 Corinthians. Here's Paul. For though we live in the world, the fleshly world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. He says this, he goes, when we go to war against the enemy, we're not really fighting the way the world does. How many of you can't shoot the devil? How many of you can't, you can't beat him up, you can't hit him with a sword? In fact, the, the, he says that this, he says, we fight with a different kind of weapon, and we're going to talk about these weapons over the next few weeks. But he says, we have a different weapon, and it says it demolishes strongholds. Everybody say stronghold. Now, now, as we talk about strongholds over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how to get rid of strongholds in our life. How many knows there's personal strongholds? There's some of us fight, it could be pride or envy or jealousy, and maybe there's an area in your life that you struggle with and you fight with, and the enemy wants to get you with that, right? Or maybe there's ideological strongholds. Can I say this in, in a nice way? Some people put their political position higher than the Word of God. And so as a believer, my first... My first uh, place that I go to is God and then everything else, right? But if I say, you know, if, I, if, if the Republican Party or the Democrat Party are the ones that decide what I believe and then I try to squeeze my Bible in there, then I've messed this whole thing up because the Bible's about the kingdom. Woo! Amen, Pastor. Thank you, guys. Y'all are awesome for shouting me down. Quit that. I'll never get through this sermon. Y'all keep acting like that. All right. And so, and so what happens is we get these strongholds, and there's, how many of those, there's, there's entertainment-type strongholds, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And so a stronghold is this, it's a way of thinking that gets, that, it's a way of thinking that gets us into a, into a box or into a prison in our own heart. And the devil, how the devil fights, when he talks about our weapons aren't of this world, how the devil fights is he tries to create a lie that you'll believe. The Bible says he's the father of all lies. So, so over time, a stronghold, you can be in church and have a stronghold. And a stronghold is this, that over time, he puts little lies into your life until you begin to believe it, until you're living with that lie. And not only at the beginning you thought maybe that's not true, but by the end of it, you're quoting that about yourself. Can, can I, I'll give you an example. You're getting out of a relationship, and, and it, was, it was just terrible, and you go, well, nobody can love me. I, I'm, you know, this, this person said I'm unlovable, but you're not sure, but they said that to you. And the devil gets right in there and says, yeah, that's you. You're unlovable. So you get in another relationship. And you're kind of halfway believing this but thinking that something happens. And so you get knocked out of that. By the time you get to the third relationship, you're quoting what the devil said. The devil just steps back and you're saying, I'm unlovable. And eventually you build a stronghold where you can't receive or give, uh, give love. And it, it hampers every relationship you have. Are y'all with me on this? And so when we talk about this, there's a spirit world that we're fighting. Um, the, uh, the scripture says this. In Ephesians 6, and this is what we're going to talk about, the armor of God, too, for a few weeks. But it says, finally, here's Paul. He says, finally. That was scaring me, girls. All right, here we go. Finally, it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Okay, here's how we fight. Here's Paul. He goes into it. He's already said, listen, you're in a, there's a spirit world out there that, that's going on around us. And he says this. He goes, we fight. He says, how we fight, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So he gives us two keys we'll talk about uh, just a little bit. But what's strong in the Lord means this. means I know the Lord. means I'm familiar with the Lord. It means I know his word. I know what he wants. I know what he likes. I know what he dislikes. Because I'm getting strong in the Lord by reading his word, understanding who he is. But his mighty power, though, is his spirit. So I need two things in my life. I need the word of God to guide me, right? But I also need to be listening to the Holy Spirit that tells me what the next step is, right? How many ever, you know, when... I'll give you an example. The Lord wants to speak to every person in here. He doesn't want to speak to you through me uh, or just through people or parents or, 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 or prophets or whatever. He wants to speak directly to you. The goal of the church is not for somebody to be totally submitted in the sense that they got to get every word from a person. That's called idol worship. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Right? That's idol worship when it's about a man and not about the kingdom, right? But, but we got to understand this, though, that God wants to speak to us individually. 
Meaning, when I wake up in the morning, I'm praying, God, what's the next step? And sometimes God will say, don't go this way, go that way. And God wants to do that for every one of us. When I'm, as a pastor, I'll be praying. And I'm like, uh, and I'll wake up in the morning, and I start praying. And all of a sudden, I'll have a picture of somebody, one of you guys in my head, or, or in my heart, so to speak. And so I'll just start praying for you. So say I'm praying for Mike, and I just begin to pray for Mike and pray for him. And so then over the next few days, I just keep praying as the Lord leads me, whoever God kind of shows me. And then, it, it, then maybe I'll, if the Lord lets me, I'll shoot a message to you. And I'll say something like, man, just praying for you. And many of you in here, you probably got that message. I do it on Facebook a lot of times. That's where I can see most of you or see you in person. And I'd say, hey, man, somebody's praying for you because God had put you on my heart. But God would direct you. He may direct you the next day. Let me tell you what's awesome. Awesome is when Christianity comes to the place where you're hearing God's voice, where you have a relationship. That's when it really gets fun is when, when you can hear God say, I want you to go in step B instead of step A. And when you start following, you see the results, man. Then you start believing God for more and more. So here's Paul. He's saying you've got an enemy. There's, a, there's spiritual warfare going on all around you. And then he says that you have to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. How many knows that now when it says the devil's schemes, it's the devil's strategy. Let, let me tell you something. We're going to give you some points about the devil. But the devil has a strategy to get every person in here. The devil has a strategy, a scheme. In fact, let me just say this. The devil and demons, they don't sleep. They're master theologians. They're, they're master of lies. And when the Bible says that when Satan shows up, he doesn't come with a pitchfork and horns, does he? He comes up as an angel of light. In other words, he's, he, comes, he comes what's appealing to you. Whatever the trigger is or the handle that you have to fight with your stronghold, that's how the devil shows up, right? And so here he says this. He goes, you've got to take, uh, take the armor of God, and we're going to talk about that, but you've got to take it because the devil's got a plan for you. Now, as I studied this, um, to give you an oversight, we're going to talk more about this in a few weeks. But in the Old Testament, there's this thing they call it a familiar spirit. How many have ever heard of a familiar spirit? A familiar spirit is like a family spirit, meaning this. In the Old Testament, it said this, to be careful because the sins would be passed down from the fathers up to hundreds, up to a thousand generations. Isn't that crazy? It says that. Meaning that the same sin can be passed down over and over and over. What's funny today in modern psychology is they teach the same thing, but they don't, they don't give a, a nuance to the spiritual principle. They teach that if you were in a relationship or if you were in a family that this happened, more than likely you're going to take it to your family when you have one, and more than likely you're going to pass it to your kids. Y'all with me on this? And so, so, so what happens is, if it's, if it's a person who's being abused, especially in a female stance, if a female's being abused, she will end up in a relationship many times with a person that's abusive. And she will pass that abuse down and it'll be generation, generation. Or maybe you'll look at a family and go, they had this addiction in this family. But then all of a sudden, it's this person has that same addiction. Then, then it's the next generation has it. And so you can look back and go, you know, my grandfather struggled with this. And then my dad struggled with this. And now there's a battle in my life to struggle with it. And here's why. Because a familiar spirit gets attached to your family and it studies you 100% of the time. It knows you. It knows, what, it knows what triggered whatever happened in Paul's granddad. And it knows what triggered whatever happened to his dad. And his goal is to destroy Paul. And so he will set up traps and temptations to try to get you because he knows in that bloodline there's certain genes or certain genetics that men tend to go in this direction. Does that make sense? And so when the devil comes to fight you, this... That devil done got in my sound. Listen, I got a bum knee, but I didn't know, do I run left or run right? I didn't see a gunman, but I was looking. Are y'all with me on this? All right. Now, I don't know what happened, but is that my hip? Is it my hip interfering with that thing? Okay, here we go. I don't know what's going on. Rex, our master sound man, Pastor Rex, is on it right now. Okay, and so here's what happens is the devil, man, he, he, knows, he knows generationally. And it's passed down. And, and the, we hear that in psychology, but the Bible said it's passed down. I think what we're wanting to do over the next few weeks is this, is we want to break this chain in our lives. Somebody's got to stand up in your generation and say, we're not putting up with what happened before, but we're going to change the course so my kids won't live with the same battles that I live with. And it's possible, but we've got to get this on our radar, that the devil, is a, he's good at what he does, and he's after you. All right, he's after you, and he wants to get you. So he says that we, we can stand against the devil's schemes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Oh, here it gets good. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against our spouse. 
Oh, y'all are reading it with me. Good. Some of you are anyway. Our, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against our boss. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against our kids. They eat and everything in my house. That's my struggle. Inflation in my kids. Y'all with me? And no, he says this. Our battle is not a person. He says we don't battle flesh and blood. He said, but we battle the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He, he lists out four levels of demonic spirits, right? He says, but we're not fighting flesh and blood. Can I say this? Your battle today ain't, 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 uh, is not the people around you. It's what you believe in your heart. What the devil, if the devil can get you to believe a lie, you'll live a lie. And the truth will set you free is what the Bible says. What sets you free is not somebody praying for you one time. That'll help. Not just knowing the scripture, but that's not. It says when you know the truth, when you get into it and it gets into you, it will set you free. And the problem is the devil's so good at what he does, many times we live a lie that we've believed for years. It's against God's word. And we've believed it because we hear it every day because we start quoting it to ourselves. Are y'all with me? This is, life, this is real life changing stuff. So, so think about this, that fight that we're going through. I remember uh, I was pastoring and uh, we were in the YMCA playing the church. And, uh, and there was, uh, we had taken, I had a little core group and I had picked up some families. And, and so we were reaching a lot of new people. It was a small church. And this guy got saved, young man got saved. And man, how many of he just, he just, he needed to get saved. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever looked at some people and go, they really need to get saved? Right? And the other people, like in church, we can hide it because we've been trained. You know what I mean? Right? We, we, we know how to smile. We could have been cussing each other out in the parking lot, but we get in the sanctuary. We're blessed going in. We're blessed going out. We're blessed in the farm. Okay, anyway, and, so, and so this guy, so he really gets saved. He look, he's just dripping with the world. And so he genuinely got saved. And he was amazed at it. And he was probably about 20 years old. And uh, here I am, and I'm, I'm standing at the door. And back then, um, what I was, how many of you ever went to that Baptist church where the pastor would stand at the door as you left and shake everybody's hand on the way out? And really what he's doing, he's just hoping one of y'all break down. Like when nobody got saved, nobody said amen. He's just staring at you like, are you the sinner? Are you the sinner? And if you break, man, he, if he gets you, everybody look what God's doing. You know what I'm talking about, that guy. So I'm at the back, and I'm shaking everybody's hand trying to build this church. And that guy comes walking up to him. And we talked about the spiritual realm. We talked about there's a fight in the devil. And, and he looks at me, and he says this. He goes, Pastor. He, said, he, is, man, he was fired up. He was kind of rocking back and forth, you know. And he, he was a rough man. I liked him. He was a great guy. And so he looks at me, and he goes, he's about telling me something. But right behind him are two little old ladies that go, have been going to church since Methuselah was born. Y'all with me on this? Now, back then, that's Methuselah's age, but now it's probably my age. But anyway, there was two little old ladies. Sweet as all get out, church all get out, very religious, very, you know, Bible thumpers. You know what I'm talking about, going to heaven and know, know the scriptures not, so they're right behind him. And so we started this little church plant, and they had jumped on board because their kids wanted to be there with me. And so we had changed how we dressed. And so they would kind of each week encourage me to move more traditional. And so I wasn't wearing suits anymore, and they would encourage me, oh, maybe we should dress it up a little bit, or maybe and we, we handed out donuts at the door. Maybe we shouldn't hand out donuts in the Lord's. You know, they were just being sweet, but pushy. Come on, somebody. And they were in line, and so he's in line, and, I, and so every week I'd have to, you know, how y'all doing, and love on them, and they were part of the congregation. This guy just got saved. He's still dripping with the world. And this is what he says. It's the greatest thing ever, greatest thing. And I'm standing there, and he goes, he goes, Pastor Joey. He says, man, it gets me so fired up. Man, I'm so sick of the devil. That devil lying and stealing and killing. And I said, yeah, that's right. He goes, keeps getting louder and louder, right? We're in the YMCA hallway, so it's echoing. He goes, if that devil showed up right now, he said, I would beat his beep. <laughs> right? I, I didn't say it. I'm being good, right? And some of y'all don't get religious on me. Like, you ain't never said that to nobody. Don't even act like you're religious now. But he said it, man, and I went. I was so fired up. I was so fired. That's what he said. He just got saved, give him some flack. And the two little ladies behind him, which was real sweet and loving, you should have saw their faces. They just looked at me like he couldn't be saved. And my reaction was I had to be careful because I couldn't be as excited as I really was because this guy really was, you know, going through a change and it's because of them. But I was. And so I'm like, and I told the first service I did this I said, I said, I know, right? You know, I'm just fired up with him. I'm like, yeah, Spartans, I'm screaming, right? I pull my Glock out, pow, pow, pow. Let's go kill the devil. You know what I'm saying? As soon as he walks off, I look at them and say, y'all need to pray for his soul. He don't even know the Lord. 
He's a cusser boy. All right. So, so, yeah, so, so I, love, I love the scripture. It says we're in a fight. How many of us there's a demonic attack against you? And if we could see in the spirit, we show, let me show you a scripture on this. You are not alone in your battles. How many's ever fought a battle? Nikki was talking about this morning, and you feel alone. Okay, let me, let me read you this scripture. It's the Old Testament. It's a whole sermon itself, but we're just going to read it. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So here's Elisha's servant, and when they got up, guess what happened? He got up. He, the king had been threatening them. The, all the king's chariots and horses surrounded them. He knew he was about to die. This is the servant. And he said, oh, no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And this is what the prophet said. The prophet said, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, get the picture. Here he is. The prophet walks out. He's just sipping his coffee. He don't care, eating a croissant. Come on, somebody. He's just sitting there, and, just, and the guy's just freaking out. We're about to die. And he says, no, we're not. There's more for us than them. If I was him, I'd have went, one, two. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know what I'm saying? There's just two of us. And he said, no. And this is what he said. He said, open, he said, uh, open his eyes. Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, when he could see into the spirit, he realized God had already given them the victory. I'm going to tell you at the end what happens, but we already have victory through Jesus Christ. And what the devil do, he will lie to you and say you're stuck in the situation or you're stuck with this stronghold the rest of your life and it's going to destroy you. You're not worthy. You can't make it. But the truth is that if we can see in the spirit, there is a fight going on around us. There is a, there's armies of the Lord that's fighting for us. There's, angels are ministering spirits and they're sent to minister to us. And as you pray, God does things in, in the heavenlies. Amen? So there's more for you than there's against you. Let me give you another one. Your prayers are far more powerful than you know. How many folks have ever given up praying about something? And you just feel like it ain't happening? Or, or, or you're fighting? Let me give you a story on this. When you pray in the spirit, things begin to shake. The problem is we don't always see in the spirit. If you put, let me give you a good uh, illustration. If you're, you're praying for your spouse, and I've had this happen throughout, throughout history, I'll have somebody come in. A lot of times it's a lady say, I'm praying for my husband to come to church where you pray for him. And I tell them every time, I say, we're going to pray, and you pray because you have the power of influence and prayer in that house. But when we pray, don't expect them to get better right away. In fact, expect them to act ugly. Because the moment you begin to pray, God, I want this man saved, I want this man in church, all of a sudden you activate heaven. God says, God steps up, angels begin to minister. And what happens a lot of times with people when they get under conviction, they get worse until they get the freedom, until they ask Christ to come in their life. Does that make sense? And so when you begin to pray, things happen. Here's what happened with Daniel. He said, then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request, your re your request has been heard in heaven. Now notice he said, the moment you start to pray, your request was heard in heaven. He says, I have come in answer to your prayer. This angel. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia it says the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my ways then Michael one of the archangels came to help me and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia now I'm here to explain what will happen to your people in the future for this vision concerns a time yet to come here's what happened Daniel began to pray for an answer and the, the moment he prayed God heard it and God sent the answer with an angel to come give him the message but as the angel came down in the heavenlies, when I read earlier about the different levels of a demonic spirit, it talks about principalities or rulers. He says this is the spirit prince of Persia. Persia was a nation. Persia was an empire. And so there was a Grecian empire, and when they change over, it's different spirits that run these countries. Can, can I get a little deep with you guys? We, we, we think, uh, we, we get so aligned with a, a party affiliate on our politics that we end up missing out that God's doing something bigger than that that this world is set up to go backwards the devil wants to take control of the United States and wants to destroy the lives and the people here and make it ungodly so that's why when we vote we have to vote according to what's spiritual and what's the truth not whether we like or don't like somebody or whatever the name because my mama was y'all with me on this Boy, I'm preaching good in the prison thank you pastor 
right? And so here he comes. He says, I prayed, but there was a strong spirit. This spirit was so strong, he was the prince over Persia, and God had to send Michael to fight him. And while they're fighting, I brought you the answer. Sometimes your answer is on the way and we give up too soon because there's a battle in the heavenlies over your purpose and the next step in your life. Amen? Let, let, me, tell, let me tell you why praise and worship is so good. Praise and worship is this. Some of the best praise is not after you get your blessing. It's easy for me to say, God, thank you after the, the, the blessings come through. But the Bible says this, that there were ten lepers and the majority didn't even come back to thank Jesus after he healed them. Sometimes we're ungrateful because even after we get the blessing, we don't shout and praise. But you know what real Christianity is? It's knowing this, that my faith says that God heard me, and I know I'm struggling, and I know I'm fighting, but I'm going to lift my hands and give God glory anyway. I'm going to lift up my hands and tell him how big he is and how awesome he is. I know I haven't got healed yet, but I know by his stripes I am healed, that he's already delivered me. I know the breakthrough financially hadn't come, but I'm a giver, God, and you said you would open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing out on me. And when the church begins to praise what I call on credit, we can realize that there's something already coming from heaven. It's just got to fight the battle to get to you. So the real question to me is, do I want it bad enough? Do I want God to move bad enough? Do I want to be free? Do I, do I, do I really genuinely, is it worth me reading my word? Is it worth me getting into church? Is it worth me giving up some things that I like in my flesh? Am I really chasing after God or am I just wanting something to show up? Boy, y'all are quiet group. But I'm feeling good. Are you with me on this? So I'm telling you, some of y'all's breakthroughs on the way. Some of the things you've been praying for. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's different types of strongholds, and there's, there's, uh, there's ideological strongholds. How many of there's personal strongholds that we have? Right? You can have pride, envy, jealousy. It's personal. But there's ideological meaning that sometimes the, 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 what we hear the world talking about, we tie into that like it's Scripture. And the truth is we need to have the Word above everything. How many of there's cultural strongholds? You know what a cultural stronghold? We may talk all one Sunday about this. It's when the whole culture believes something and everybody believes it and because of that we buy into it because we don't want to be canceled. Is anybody with me on this? Is it because everybody's saying it then we say that's okay. Some things just ain't okay. Some things aren't in the Word of God, right? And so regardless of whether you like it, I like it, or anybody else, if the Word's against it, man, we got to stand with the Word. Right? Here's, here's, what, uh, here's what the devil does. Let me give you a few things real quick. Is this all right today? Uh, you, did I tell y'all how good looking y'all were today? This is the best looking group I've preached to after 1030. <laughs> how many of you got to lie to all your kids? I love you the most. Come on, somebody. You know you like one better. Come on. The one that's going to not put you in the nursing home. Here, here we go. Here's, the, here's, the, here's a few things that the devil does to do some teaching. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. Scripture says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Let me stop here for a minute. What's that mean? How many remembers before you got saved? Did, was anybody before you got saved thought the church was crazy? I remember growing up, I, did, I got saved around 18, but I remember before that, I remember thinking, because I was out acting a fool, and I remember thinking, all the friends I went, with, went out with that went to church, one was a pastor's son, and so he would have to get up on Sunday and go to church. And I remember thinking how dumb that was. What a waste of time that is. And then I remember going with them a few times and when they'd take up the offer and I thought, well, this is crazy. People just throwing their money away. That, that was my thought. And I thought it was just a dumb idea, right? But you know what? I, I didn't have my heart saved. And so the devil, he will blind you. How many of us he'll blind you from things? And so when you go out talking to people about spiritual stuff, when I go to preach on this, there's certain things on Sunday that I preach on that, that, I, that, I, that I have to... Uh, kind of soften it up a little bit. But when I have leadership lessons or I'm training staff or training pastors, I can be a much, much harder because they haven't been blinded, so to speak. Does that make sense? Because every week we have people here that know God and we have people just kicking the tire, seeing what church is about. But he says the devil is great at blinding us. Meaning you can have a big blind spot in your life called a self-awareness problem that you don't see. You can sit in church and think you have it all together, but everybody around you goes, no, if you would just change this one thing, if you would just get this one thing right, it would catapult your life. Has anybody been around that person? You ever had a friend that asked you to tell, to, for you to tell them the truth and you really can't? Because, you know, the moment you tell them the real truth, that, you, you know, you are that person, they're going to get mad at you, right? And so what Satan does is he wants you not to believe it. 
Man, he wants to hide it. What's the best? If I'm the devil, the best thing I could do is have that percentage high. As long as people don't believe there's a hell and believe there's a devil, then they ain't going to worry about me and I can have my way. Second thing he does, he steals God's word from you. He steals God's word from you. Now, Scripture says this, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. In other words, when you hear a word, the devil wants to take that word from you. Why is it so hard to read the Bible? Is anybody with me on this? Why can we remember every lyric of every song going back 30 years? But we can't. We, it's defi- John 3, 16, I'm not, it's on the tip of my tongue, right? It's, so we have a difficult time. He says that the devil comes and he steals it. How, how many has ever been in service? And, and I used to do youth camps. I, and we, our kids got back from youth and they get fired up. And I used to do youth camps all over the country when I was a youth pastor. And they kids would be fired up, man, snot. And how many knows when you have a real move of God in your life, you'll blow one of them Jesus bubbles? He just snotting and crying. And then, but how many knows about two weeks later, if you don't have a good youth ministry and, and good parents and, and good pushing, that that honeymoon stage can, can, can leave? And all of a sudden it goes and people say, yeah, I can see that. But it also happens with us, guys, with us as adults. Have you ever been in the service? I'm changing this today. That word was from me. Today I'm changing. And then you get, by the time you get to your car, you're like, I don't even believe that mess. Right? Or you, by the time you, get, you wake up Monday, it's kind of got away from you. Because the devil wants to steal your word from you. Because when you get the word in you, it changes how you think. And when it changes how you think, you begin to see and those shackles come off your eyes. So his goal is to steal that word from you. Here's, here's how you can use the devil. If you got insomnia, just pretend to read your Bible. He'll put you to sleep every time. All right, that was a joke, but no laughing occurred. So it, apparently it's not. Okay, here we go. Third thing is he sets traps to ensnare you. Remember I said he's a great theologian. He's a good devil. He will set traps to, to ensnare you. And that, uh, it says in Timothy, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. You know, a lot of people will oppose the purpose in your life when you really chase after God. Because the devil does not want you fulfilling your purpose. He wants to hold you back. And the moment you begin to get in tune with God in here, man, the devil's going to fight you. He's going to keep you. He sets traps. Remember I said he knows your family, he knows who you are? He sets traps, right? Here's, um, here's a thought. There's strongholds, there's entertainment strongholds that said that. How many, how many um, can remember all those, you got songs you can remember way back when? How many can go back, I'm going to be honest, there's some songs if I hear on my Sirius XM, and there's some songs, and I'm not uh, holier than thou on anything, and I know people listen to different things, but there was a, I was watching TikTok one day. How many's ever got in TikTok jail? And been in there four hours, you don't know it, watching 30 second clips, just, just spinning that thing, right? And so I was watching, and there was the new, the Generation X, I guess, the new kids, we're listening to old 80s songs and for the first time. And, you know, reading the lyrics were coming up. And, I mean, they would play some songs. And I'm like, I know that song. I know every word of that song. Is anybody with me on this? I, I could sing Prince. And even when he hiccups or does a dance move, I know when to go, hee hee. I know all that stuff. <laughs> I knew it, right? I think I want to dance. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so, and so I'm listening. Then I read the lyrics. And I'm like, oh, my Lord. That's what that talked about? I thought we were clean and this group was bad. We just hit it a little better. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's 90s, it's 2000s. And so you, you watch it and you, I can remember every lick. And here's what's crazy is if some of these songs come on, it used to be bad and I had to fast some of it, but the song comes on and it trans, it, it, it takes you back. You go back and so I, there's some songs, if it kicks going, I'm like, I'm in my friend's 68 Cougar. We're, we're going up and down the, the mile. You know what I'm talking about. And it takes me back to those, those days. I'm not even saying much more about it, right? And then certain songs now, if they come on, like if uh, uh, ACDC shook me all night long came on. Y'all following what I'm saying here? I get transported to an ungodly time in my life. Y'all with me on this? And somebody said, oh, not me, but it was uh, Run DMC. I can, I, Run DMC just came out. I loved a bunch of their songs, right? You know, it's Christmas time in Hollis. You know what I'm talking about. All these songs, but here's what happens. They can be a stronghold because you can hear a song. Here's where it gets a romantic song. Or some Marvin Gaye comes on. Don't make me sing. I sang for first service. They loved it. But can come on and it translates you. You're married now with kids, but it takes you back thinking and romanticizing about somebody or something in the past. It got quiet in here all of a sudden. 
All the men's like, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. All right, you hadn't even heard that? He lying up there, baby. He lying right now to Jesus. All right, anyway, so it takes you back. Why? Because it's a stronghold, right? It's a stronghold, and some, some, some music's benign, but that's why you have to be careful what you listen, what you watch, because sometimes it may not affect you the way it affects me, but we all have triggers, and those familiar spirits know, oh, if I can get Mike to think about this song, then it's going to take him back, back when he had them floods, and that mullet. He was a star quarterback. Come on now. Spirit hands. His wife had spirit hands. All right. And so she was a cheerleader. All right, here we go. So here's the next one. He, he fights you. He fights to stop you. Um, for we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. The moment you begin chasing God, the devil's going to fight you. This, this sermon series I'm doing is going to expose some strongholds, some lies of the devil. It may be the hardest time for you to get back to church over the next few weeks. It'll be something to pop up, some little fight, some, something to go through your mind. I'm telling you, get here. It's been a fight for me to be here. That's what Nikki was talking about earlier. Because here's what happens. The moment you begin to fulfill God's purpose, the devil's coming against you. He's going to come again. The moment you make a decision, how many's ever made a decision to follow God? And then the next day, it's like, man, and you start struggling with it. I want to do that, but I'll have to give up this. Come on, somebody. And he'll fight you. Here's, here's the next one. I've got to move fast. He plans to destroy you. Here's the, the big key to it when we talk about the devil. The Bible says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That scripture is so rich. But he says the devil wants to devour you, kill you. Let me say it this way. The devil hates your guts. The devil hates your marriage. The devil hates when you worship. The de devil wants to destroy you financially. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to destroy your kids. If he gets a chance, he will destroy everything in your life because you are the people that God has called to take his place. We are as the, the worship people in the kingdom. And he had that top job. He was right under Christ, and he was leading worship to heaven. And pride got lifted up in him. And when pride lifted up in him, he fell. And now everything in us, he sees that we're trying to chase after God. We're in God's image, and he hates God so much, he hates us. He hates his kids. And if he gets a chance, he will destroy you. And here's where the big part is as a Christian believer is, man, we're kind of passive about our Christianity. But the truth is, if we want to change this world, we need to get a little more militant. We need to get, we need to get militant about our worship. We need to get militant about the word we're getting into. Are y'all with me on this? Uh, we, we need to be people to realize the devil ain't playing, but some of us are playing. I've, I've done that. I, I got, I'm, I'm relaxed. I'm chill, and I forget my mission. But the mission is bigger than my situation. And God's able to pull us through. So the spiritual battle is this. Let me give it to you. We're not going to preach on this, but I'm going to read the scripture. Next week, we're going, to, we're going to come and break this down a little bit better. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Okay, the full armor of God. Beating strongholds is a way of thinking. So we're going to break down each piece of the armor over the next few weeks. He says that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Then it says this, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Why? Because your prayers make a difference. Because the devil is real and your prayers they, they create an atmosphere of warfare over your life. He says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Isn't that awesome? Don't have time to break that down, but I'm telling you, we're going to get in some word over the next few weeks. Here's the big thought I want you to leave with. So you say, Pastor, well, you just hammered me. I have strongholds. Can I, can I be honest with everybody in here? All of us have places in our lives that can be strongholds because we have a flesh nature, Right? The blood of Jesus covers us, God forgives us, and we're seated in heavenly places with God. But the truth is, there's some problems and some fights that you have to fight through with the armor of God. You've got to have faith. You've got to get the sword of the Spirit. You've got to get the word in you. And you've got to put on some righteousness. Are y'all with me? There's some battles you have to go through. But here's what I want you to know, is God absolutely loves you. That God is, you're not to walk in fear. And here's my, here's my point. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. The war that, that we think that Satan and Jesus are fighting each other, Satan and God's fighting each other, that's, that's just not true. 
Satan is a created being. There's no fight between them. God is absolutely, absolutely in control. Absolutely a winner, right? And this is what happened, that Christ has put us in a place to win. And so if you have a stronghold, or if you have a, a battle, let me say something to you. You're normal. Y'all with me? You're normal. Don't, don't let the devil whisper that you're the only one. You're not the only one. You're just like everybody else. We all have different triggers, different handles. And sometimes we're on top. Sometimes we struggle. Can I be that honest? Sometimes, sometimes we're doing it, but man, we feel like the, the, the wheels are about to come off. Sometimes we feel like we're doing great, right? And so here's what we have. We have victory, and here's the scripture. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Isn't that awesome? He says, you've overcome all these problems. He says, because what's in you is bigger than what's in the world. We can break through the cultural strongholds and the ideological strongholds. We just got to get the word in us. Amen? Because God's already given us the victory. When he died on the cross, that blood was shed that we might know him. Amen? And he took us from death unto life. So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about this. How do we, and we're going to get it next week. What's a stronghold? How do we break it? And how do we, uh, how do we armor up for every battle that God brings? Amen? Is that all right today? Yes. All right. Love y'all. Let, let me pray over y'all real quick. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth, God. Lord, I just ask for your blessing today over each family. I ask for favor. God, where we've believed, li believed lies in our lives, I pray that you would reveal it to us, that you would break it free over the next few weeks. God, I thank you for freedom. I thank you for breakthrough. And God, I thank you for deliverance. And God, over this congregation, I pray peace and I pray your love. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 Can we give God one more hand clap? Y'all are so nice. <laughs> Do me a favor if you can. Bring somebody back next week. We're going to start going through the armor. Invite somebody you know that needs to hear some truth. And man, we want to be a blessing. Amen? Let's all stand up. Slap about three high fives. Man, have a great week. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here today. There is no shine.